This week on Dialogue, the future of higher education. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molesky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Now let's meet our guests. Jeff Abernathy is president of Alma College. Previously, Dr. Abernathy served as vice president and dean of Augustana College. Rich Morrill is president of the Teagle Foundation. Dr. Morrill is also chancellor of the University of Richmond, where he formerly served as president. Gentlemen, welcome to Dialogue. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. So a little background on your current work. Tell us about Alma College, Jeff. Alma College is 125 years old. This, uh, this year we uh, celebrate that uh, mark as a national liberal arts college, uh, educating students from across the country and indeed the globe, and are reaching uh, beyond uh, uh, Michigan to bring students from, uh, from China, from Ecuador, and, and countries beyond as we internationalize our campus uh, this year. And that is a trend in campuses, uh, more international? It certainly is an important one, I think, for, uh, uh, for American colleges and universities, and one uh, we've uh, pushed hard to, to get into. Well, happy anniversary, 125th. Thank you. Uh, you look too young for that. Uh, Rich, how about the Teagle Foundation? Teagle Tell Foundation Teagle Teagle is um, uh, focused on support of higher education, and we're located in New York City. We particularly have been interested in the last seven or eight years in improving student learning on college campuses. Where does your support come from? Support comes from the endowment that was given to the foundation by the founder, Walter Teagle, who served as the president and chief executive of uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey, huh. now, now known as the ExxonMobil Corporation. So what's the, the legacy tie to education? The, uh, the donor had a particular interest in offering educational opportunity for young people to go to college. And we have programs in New York to try to give low-income kids a shot at college education. And we also are concerned about the quality of education, yeah, in, particularly in higher education. That was another interest of Mr. Teagle's. Uh, I want to start with some conventional wisdom about um, education and higher education in particular. You know, generally, the shorthand is America has some issues when it comes to uh, grade school and high school. But when we get to higher education, that's where America shines and is the best system in the world. Does that conventional wisdom still hold true today? I think it does. American higher education uh, is still the envy of the world in, in many, many ways. We have uh, considerable challenges, but uh, as we look uh, across the globe, we see students coming in increasing numbers uh, from Asia in particular uh, for American higher education. It's, uh, it's a great uh, export strategy why, for us. Why is that? What is it uh, particularly about American higher education that makes it so attractive? I think it's the liberal education that is at the core of American higher education that's always been the model for, uh, for United States and colleges. And define that. Liberal. In this town, saying liberal versus conservative uh, has different connotations. What are you talking about? So liberal education that focuses on critical thinking, on problem solving, on uh, traditional uh, rhetoric, on uh, enabling students to speak their mind in the, in the public forum and to be to act as citizens once they graduate from our institutions. These are the core values for institutions across the land, and I think it's uh, one reason that we are seen as being as having such a strong higher education system. Rich, I, the, the conventional wisdom, do you agree? Is, is, are we still I think it's largely true. There's probably never been a time in our nation's history when higher education is more important to our future than is the case now. And I think that there are, the, the sun is shining in many ways in terms of uh, the quality and the reach of American education. But we would have to emphasize, too, that there are a lot of clouds out there as well. Why more important than ever? Well, because when you look at the preparation of students, certainly for the thing that people think about these days, which is economic competitiveness, then you have to look at education as one of the central ways in which we respond to that challenge. But it's not, a, uh, if you will, a narrow focus on a job slot. It's a broader concern to, uh, as Jeff was suggesting, develop the competencies that citizens need in order to be effective in a democracy. So, so not incompatible with this notion of liberal education. This isn't a job factory. Uh, you know, the, the most colleges and universities now have developed a variety of ways in which students can pursue uh, a major in a traditional liberal arts discipline or, which is very common now, they blend their programs and they have a very strong focus on a professional area or in a vocational area, but also with substantial work in a lot of the basic fields because it prepares them to think uh, effectively in a lot of different parts of their lives. 
so that they can solve problems, they know how to communicate, they can write better than they otherwise would. They have all the tools at their disposal that they'll need later on in life. Is there something in the, uh, the history of American higher education that led to this type of approach? Is there something we can identify where we are different than other parts of the world in our approach to higher ed? Well, there's a strong focus that comes out of, I guess you'd call it the, uh, the Anglo-Saxon heritage, the ideals that came with a lot of our uh, you know, early settlers. Classical education. A classical education uh, with you know, solid uh, work in uh, the basic, basic fields of thought. That clearly has evolved. But there always has been the idea of, uh, if you will, a certain measure of uh, of diverse exposure to different ways of thinking. If you go back to the Yale report of 1819, which is a kind of landmark uh, report, there was the notion uh, emerging then that it's a question of developing both an understanding of ideas and content, but also of different ways of thinking, of the powers, they, they use the phrase, the powers of the mind. And so the melding of those, uh, I think, has created for us um, a rather broad approach to education, the, the idea of what we call general education, as well as then focusing on a specific discipline. And those, those two things don't often appear together in other societies. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, complacency is always something you have to guard against when you consider yourself to be the top dog. And there was this uh, recent book released in January, Academically Adrift, that mm -hmm. starts to identify maybe some cracks in the foundation. Uh, I, I'm assuming you're both familiar with the book. We are. Uh, can you be, uh, talk about what are some of the, the emerging challenges or problems that you're seeing? I think it's clear that uh, colleges and universities have to be more flexible than they have in the past, and they have to understand better than perhaps we, we have what the outcomes of our education is. We haven't done enough in years past uh, to, to study those outcomes, to demonstrate for the public uh, what it is that students learn in college and how that prepares them, not merely for a first job, but for a career and for a life of giving back to, uh, to communities. Uh, that work of, uh, of studying what students learn is, is something that uh, the, the book certainly is, is focused upon. Uh, the Teagle Foundation has been focused upon in recent years and many others are beginning to study. Certainly small colleges like Alma College are focused just on that as well. What is it the students learn and how do we connect that uh, to the lives they live after they graduate? The lack of flexibility, Jeff, that you describe, uh, what, what is the, the source of that? Is it just a matter of uh, being stuck in a rut doing things the way you've always done things? It's true that change can be uh, can be hard in many institutions, and that's uh, that is the case for for higher education. Perhaps I think uh, the opportunities uh, before us now are to really to see the challenges uh, in in our society and to engage with that society to demonstrate the ways in which universities and colleges alike can help our society to uh, to change and to solve the, uh, the substantial challenges before us. Rich, one of the startling things, uh, at least for me, that the book, uh, the study behind the book unveils is that uh, reasoning and writing skills aren't improving for undergraduates from the start of when they arrive as freshmen to when they reach the end of their four-year degree. Uh, could you talk about what, what the problem is there that is identified? I think that, uh, John, you're right about that uh, conclusion. It, the results are really quite mixed uh, in terms of the degree of progress we'd expect. One of the really valuable insights of the book, based upon some pretty good data collection, is that the expectations that are held out for students are probably less than they're capable of responding to. So the amounts of reading, this comes back to basic things really. I mean, how much reading are you expected to do per class? Uh, what kind of preparation time is it that you should really be putting into each course? And it's clear that there's a pretty close correlation between the lower scores on the instrument they've used in this uh, research and how much time you're spending writing and how much time you're spending uh, preparing for class. Mm -hmm. So there is, in general, a kind of, uh, not across the board, but certainly in too many places, a lack of rigor and expectation. There are other factors, too, though, and, and some of it has to do with the total incentive system. As a professor nowadays, uh, the recognition and the rewards often go disproportionately uh, to your success uh, as a publisher and as a researcher. Those are good things. We can't for a minute deny that they're vital and, and critical. But there's also the fact that the professional rewards that uh, come from effectiveness in teaching, and let's say now student learning, which obviously is intimately related to teaching, 
uh, probably needs to be lifted up and given more attention to reward a faculty member, to reward a program that has a particularly good record of seeing growth in student performance is probably something we should be thinking hard about now. Well, what, what you described is sort of the knee bone connected to the shin bone. In other words, if a professor is assigning a lot of reading or a lot of writing, then he or she needs to grade it. And so that doesn't give them time for those extracurricular activities that raise their standing. That's the pinch. That's the trap we're in. That's the pinch. And we simply are going to have to find ways in which we can uh, balance that equation more effectively. Do we have any ideas in that regard? Well, I think some of it is uh, ways in which you can shift that dial, uh, again, by reward systems. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean radically recrafting what we're doing, but it does mean that there is a powerful message that comes with both symbol and reality. So if a program that has a particularly strong track record in seeing student progress were to receive a recognition of an additional small grant so that professors in fact could spend more time uh, turning the evidence they've gathered into new kinds of approaches to teaching, that would go a long way. The signaling power uh, of that in an academic community is very high. So those kinds of things can begin to shift uh, the equation. I think that's, that's exactly right. It seems to me oh, what's happened over 20 years is that our pedagogy really has begun to change the way we go about teaching so that increasingly undergraduate research, engaging students in the research that one does as a faculty member uh, is, is an enormous trend. And, uh, and that's a way of rewarding faculty for the work that they do. That's a trend that certainly small colleges have embraced and increasingly uh, universities as well. Why are we seeing a decrease in rigor? That's the, the word that Rich used. Uh, and how, from a, the, the vantage point of a university president, looking at the, all of the instruction taking place on the campus, uh, how do you monitor that? Uh, how much do you get involved in suggesting a standard for rigor? Well, it's, it's, it's clear that across the, from the study, from across the country, that we are uh, teaching less uh, in terms of writing instruction, expecting less in terms of longer papers, which we know correlate with deeper learning for, uh, for students. Uh, so for, uh, for our college, Alma College, we uh, do study the number of uh, papers that students write through their years. We have added, in response to some of our study, uh, additional classes that require students to write, uh, write more papers from their earliest years at the college. As we add majors, uh, we want to be sure that they are rigorous at their, at their core. And not just, uh, of course, preparing for graduation, but preparing as well uh, for the lives beyond Alma. Do the students arrive at Alma College prepared for a rigorous uh, course of study? Uh, they, they do. They're, they're uh, excellent students uh, who arrive uh, prepared to study. There's, of course, a range. Um, uh, but they do have done exceptionally well uh, in, in high school and come to college uh, prepared to, to work harder. Nationally, we see the average is about 12 hours uh, per, per week for students studying outside of the classroom. Uh, we are beyond that, uh, but we want to be even further still than, than we are. And we know we've got some work to do nationally. Teagle does work in trying to uh, provide uh, support for economically disadvantaged youth. So we do. To attend college. Uh, and we still, the, the study in the book shows a gap uh, where it comes to race and ethnicity, often tied to socioeconomics. Uh, how are students in general across the nation prepared for the rigor that we're suggesting in this discussion? There's a sobering required? set of analyses, uh, not unlike what you find in Academically Adrift. Other books, uh, particularly a book by uh, Bowen, McPherson, and Chingos on um, crossing the finish line, which shows the uh, consistent relationship between lower income and, uh, if you will, less attainment, less completion rates in, in college. A lot of it is directly tied to economic circumstance, and one of the factors that is very obvious is that students who don't have the resources often have to work disproportionate amounts of time in order to afford college. And so that often uh, knocks them out of the box. It creates too many pressures and burdens on top of the ones that they already bring with them. You know, kids often come to college, uh, they perhaps uh, did not succeed in high school the way they wanted to, so they have a deficit to make up as they start college. They find that they have to have developmental courses before they can effectively do a two-year degree or four-year degree. In the meantime, as they're trying to build up their skills, they may have started a family and suddenly they've got an enormous set of uh, burdens on them. Mm -hmm. And those things together help to complicate, I think, the, the pathway for lower income students. I think that uh, we can make a guess, an educated guess, that uh, parents listening to this program or watching this program, when we talk about the future of higher education, are interested in focusing on the cost of higher education as part <coughs> of that discussion. Uh, the trends clearly are more expensive. Uh, college costs have gone up something like 50% while most family incomes in real dollars have dropped. 
These are uh, incompatible trends. What's happening in the world of uh, education, higher education, that can give us some hope for the future as far as the spiraling costs? Uh, uh, costs are increasing at every institution, and uh, for too many, they've increased uh, well beyond inflation, as you suggest. Uh, for, I think, many uh, private institutions, what we're seeing, though, is that uh, they're finding ways to offer more and more scholarship dollars to uh, constrain those costs for families to make college affordable, uh, that we're increasingly focused on make, uh, giving access uh, to, to students from a range of economic backgrounds. Um, it's a considerable challenge, but uh, that the schools are set, setting up um, ways in which uh, they, those who come from unfortunate backgrounds or who are challenged can find their way to college. Is there any way to actually bring the costs down? Uh, because at a, in a time of uh, limited resources, uh, financial aid might not be able to provide enough support. We have to work uh, together better than we have in the past. We have to find ways of working within consortia, uh, working with other colleges, reaching out to partner, so that we aren't constantly replicating what uh, each campus is, is doing. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility, something we're looking into at Alma, certainly. One of the things that must be distressing to those of you working in the field is a lot of this new literature and discussion that maybe it's not worth it. Maybe college is a bad investment. Um, and this is completely tied to this equation of how much it costs, how much debt you incur, and then what kind of jobs you can look forward to. John, the, the, the headline is absolutely right that um, there have been real issues in uh, college pricing, there's no question. But that, that, number one, really does depend a lot on each family's particular circumstances. So anyone listening in today, I would suggest, could really look carefully at the situation of the colleges they're interested in. And they'd often find there's a lot more opportunity than the sticker price would suggest. So before one gets alarmed, it's important to look at specific circumstance. The worth of the college education is something that I think Jeff and I would uh, say uh, has got to be really focused on very carefully. There's the economic question. Uh, there's also, if you will, the educational value question. And as I suggested earlier, I don't think there's ever been a time when education is proving itself to be the central way into our future. The worth has to do with the shaping of a lot of your basic human potential and opportunity. And that is a vital matter for the individual and for the society. So I would not for a minute think that uh, the worth equation has diminished, it's only increased. Mm -hmm. Do, but will we see any, are there any things on the horizon? I think I'd heard recently some school was considering a, a three-year undergraduate degree as a way of bringing costs down. There are a lot of ways I think that we can re-sculpt uh, the things that we're doing in higher education to make it more effective. The Teagle has put a lot of energy and resources into helping colleges develop better ways to get evidence about where students are are learning and where they can use that evidence to improve. Well, when you find areas that need improvement, those are areas where you want to put your investments. Things where you're not doing as well, then you might want to back away from. So that you've got to be more efficient in the use of your resources, there's no question. The, the fact is, as Jeff suggested, a lot of learning now takes place in programs off the campus. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a delocalized world for education now. You do research with professors that may or may not be on campus. You're studying abroad. You're in internships all over the country. And those, I think, potentially offer ways in which, particularly for certain students, you could find um, much greater variety in the amount of time it would take you to complete your degree. I think there are some students who could put together summer experiences and end up graduating uh, before four years, save themselves a half year's tuition, a year's tuition. Not every student uh, would find themselves in that circumstance, but it's worth pressing those opportunities, particularly for those students who come you know, at the wrong place in the economic spectrum. spectrum. What, what Rich describes, Jeff, does it suggest even a radical departure from the way that we organize uh, higher education? It, it does suggest that we've got to examine the curriculum and how we've taught uh, classes for a hundred years, that we've got to rethink and engage with community better than we have. We've got to think about the place of the internship, uh, the, th the place of experiences beyond the campus, um, such that they become a part of the curriculum. And increasingly, I think that is, is the trend. On the three-year degree, I think there are great opportunities. We certainly see students, as Rich suggests, graduate in, in three years. I think, too, the focus needs to be on the four-year degree, uh, because the trend has been that students are graduating in five and six years. And for most 
most liberal arts colleges, though, you'd see uh, that 80 percent, 90 percent of their graduates are graduating within four years, which is the case for, for us. Mm -hmm. I think focusing on, on completing in that time is also, uh, should be a priority. A Chronicle of it, Higher Ed and Pew did a study together, and one of the findings was that more than a third of uh, university presidents and leadership uh, think that we're headed in the wrong direction. Your, your peers, are, are you in that number, or are you in the two-thirds who feel a little more optimistic about what I we're certainly heading? took the survey. I'm in the two-thirds. I'm optimistic. Are. We've got good opportunities. We have to do better at telling our story and demonstrating outcomes. That's clear. And we have to rethink uh, the way we've done our work for uh, for the last century. So what are those third of your peers talking about when they're concerned about the wrong direction? As, as the Pew study demonstrated, uh, there are a number of colleges that have uh, very substantial uh, financial challenges just now, and uh, that correlates with those presidents who are most concerned, perhaps most pessimistic about the, the years ahead. It, it is tough to, uh, to make a go with uh, the cuts that state schools in particular are, are seeing. Um, we've seen an enormous drop, an enormous decline in the, the funds going to state schools in, in particular, and they're, they're, I think, right now fairly pessimistic. Even beyond education, we, we as a nation are struggling with sort of a, a have, have not uh, paradigm that is getting wider and wider. How is that? A, is that also the case in schools? Does that describe the one third versus the two thirds? One of the interesting things that has uh, made our tuition pricing uh, go up relatively rapidly is in part an effort to provide opportunity without regard to family income. And so as we've done that, we've often been able to offer uh, very substantial support. But in the long run, that takes a lot of resources to do it. And it does have a kind of pressure on the pricing part of it. So I think that we need to rethink some of the aid policies we've had. Uh, we've often given students who did not have cleared and highly, um, uh, if you will, high needs for financial aid, financial assistance, mm -hmm. in order to perhaps attract them to the institution, to. Uh, attract them to a particular major where we wanted to build up the strength of that program. We have to rethink that because now students who have uh, high levels of demonstrated need should be the priority. What are some of the most positive trends and initiatives that you can identify? We've spent some time vetting the problems and, and looking at potential solutions. What, what are some of the things we should know about that you're most excited about? I think we're seeing that uh, a trend that we've that we've mentioned in terms of internationalization that American colleges and universities truly are reaching out uh, to become even more global than we have been and that we've had great success especially in, in China that's true for small colleges like mine it's true across the, the land I think the emphasis on uh, those practices that we know are most successful in engaging students in community giving them hands-on instruction uh, such as undergraduate research such as increased number of internships and and the like uh, these are really transforming the way we go about our work in academia that globalization aspect that you described how does that actually play out in the trenches? Does it talk, is it more students coming to your college from other countries? What about your students traveling in the other direction? It's really uh, both. We have a partnership at Alma, for example, with uh, Ecuador, uh, where we sent uh, 200 students and faculty over the last uh, years uh, to a university in Ecuador. Uh, that university will begin sending students to graduate from Alma uh, in their fourth year of college uh, next year, the 12 13 academic year. John, you know, we haven't mentioned technology, but I'm really optimistic that we're going to find ways to both improve the quality and also in some cases uh, contain costs by the right kind of use of technology. This doesn't mean that uh, it all happens at, at, at the end of your computer screen. It does mean that there are ways in which there are certain kinds of courses that can be assisted by computer related instruction. Uh, we're getting better at that. We're finding there are certain kinds of things that perhaps have a specific right answer. Uh, statistics would be one example, where some of the course could actually be done uh, without uh, the professor being involved until a certain point. You want the professor to be actively engaged. Simply doing distance learning, I don't think, is the answer. But ways in which we could be more efficient uh, in the use of technology I think is going to be a growing and positive contribution to solving uh, some of these problems. We, we've talked about things like reasoning and writing and critical thinking. Uh, before we end, I also want to spend a little time on, on civic engagement and the role of <coughs> higher education in, in creating a citizenry. Mm -hmm. I can't remember now if it was the Pew uh, report uh, or whether it was the book that talked about students reading a daily newspaper right. monthly or never. What, what is the response? 
Thirty percent, according to the book, did not uh, did not read a, yeah. a newspaper monthly. Uh, well, for for us, this is a key aspect and a key aim for for the college certainly uh, for all of our students to be deeply engaged. And we've got to model that engagement. I think as as colleges and universities uh, for Alma College, that means that we're reaching out to our our, our local region uh, to be a part of that region. To is it extra? Intern. Is it extracurricular or is it within the curriculum? Very much within. It's both, but uh, but very much within the curriculum uh, is is the emphasis now, so that students have internships that that will help them to graduate uh, in nonprofits and governmental organizations that have lost so many resources in, in recent years. We've got to help to reinvent uh, society uh, ourselves. John, there's a lot of initiative in this area. The, some of the national associations here in Washington, like the Association of American Colleges and Universities, have put a huge emphasis upon education for democratic citizenship. And many campuses, the University of Richmond is one, have center-specific engagement. And those places are really trying to help students find the right kind of volunteer service to be reflective about the process of decision making in society, to look at how resources get allocated, how the public functions in the decision making world. So I am very optimistic that we've got a big focus on that in just about all reaches of education. There is a difference now and it's a very social world on campus and the, the means of communication are just flooding everyone's experience. When I walk around campus, I rarely see students without some kind of a device in their ear. Right. They are always interacting. Now, you know, newspapers probably aren't at the top of the list for many students, but there is a kind of vehicle that we can tap into that will, I think, spread the word about the crucial importance of preparing for citizenship. Yeah, you, may, you make a good point. May, maybe measuring newspaper readership is not the beginning and end of a discussion of how engaged a student it's is. part of it, events. but it's probably can go beyond that. Right. Twitter alone is a, yeah. at least a headline service. Right. Right. Yeah. right. That's right. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed the discussion. Wish you continued success. Thanks for joining we us. We appreciate today. it. Thank you, John. Thank you. We'll return next week with another edition of Dialogue. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Milevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org. Next week on Dialogue. I think the thing that has changed materially to us is that the information age has brought about an awareness that our environment is completely interconnected. There is a complexity to this that can't be analyzed linearly, that has to, that has to have new tools applied, complexity theory or chaos theory, whatever it is, but that it's an opportunity. And, and to your point, sir, that is exactly what we wanted to capture. The thing that bothered us most about the strategies that, that we see every day in our, in our jobs on our side of the river and across the river is that they are almost universally uh, based on anticipating and countering known risk and threat.